This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Letters of Two Brides by Honoré de Balzac. Letter 10. Mademoiselle de Chaliot to Madame de l'Estrade. January. Oh, René, you have made me miserable for days. So, that bewitching body, those beautiful proud features, that natural grace of manner, that soul full of priceless gifts, those eyes, where the soul can slake its thirst as at a fountain of love, that heart, with its exquisite delicacy, that breadth of mind, those rare powers, fruit of nature and of our interchange of thought, treasures whence should issue a unique satisfaction for passion and desire, hours of poetry to outweigh years, joys to make a man serve a lifetime for one gracious gesture. All this is to be buried in the tedium of a tame, commonplace marriage. To vanish in the emptiness of an existence which you will come to loathe. I hate your children before they are born. They will be monsters. So you know all that lies before you. You have nothing left to hope or fear or suffer. And supposing the glorious morning rises which will bring you face to face with the man destined to rouse you from the sleep into which you are plunging. Ah, a cold shiver goes through me at the thought. Well, at least you have a friend. You, it is understood, are to be the guardian angel of your valley. You will grow familiar with its beauties, will live with it in all its aspects, till the grandeur of nature, the slow growth of vegetation, compared with the lightning rapidity of thought, become like a part of yourself, and as your eye rests on the laughing flowers you will question your own heart. When you walk between your husband, silent and contented, in front, and your children screaming and romping behind, I can tell you beforehand what you will write to me. Your misty valley, your hills, bare or clothed with magnificent trees, your meadow, the wonder of Provence, with its fresh water dispersed in little runlets, the different effects of the atmosphere, this whole world of infinity which laps you round, and which God has made so various, will recall to you the infinite sameness of your soul's life. But at least I shall be there, my René, and in me you will find a heart which no social pettiness shall ever corrupt, a heart all your own. MONDAY my dear, my Spaniard is quite adorably melancholy. There is something calm, severe, manly, and mysterious about him which interests me profoundly. His unvarying solemnity and the silence which envelops him act like an irritant on the mind. His mute dignity is worthy of a fallen king. Griffith and I spend our time over him as though he wore a riddle. How odd it is! A language-master captures my fancy as no other man has done. Yet by this time I have passed in review all the young men of family, the attachés to embassies, and the ambassadors, generals, and inferior officers, the peers of France, their sons and nephews, the court, and the town. The coldness of the man provokes me. The sandy waste which he tries to place and does place between us is covered by his deep-rooted pride. He wraps himself in mystery. The hanging back is on his side, the boldness on mine. This odd situation affords me the more amusement, because the whole thing is mere trifling. What is a man, a Spaniard, and a teacher of languages to me? I make no account of any man whatever, were he a king. We are worth far more, I am sure, than the greatest of them. What a slave I would have made of Napoleon! If he had loved me, shouldn't he have felt the whip? Yesterday I aimed a shaft at Monsieur Henares which must have touched him to the quick. He made no reply. The lesson was over, and he bowed with a glance at me, in which I read that he would never return. This suits me capitally. There would be something ominous in starting an imitation Nouvelle Héloïse. 
I have just been reading Rousseau's, and it has left me with a strong distaste for love. Passion, which can argue and moralize, seems to me detestable. Clarissa also is much too pleased with herself and her long little letter, but Richardson's work is an admirable picture, my father tells me, of English women. Rousseau's seems to me a sort of philosophical sermon, cast in the form of letters. Love, as I conceive it, is a purely subjective poem. In all that books tell us about it there is nothing which is not at once false and true. And so, my pretty one, as you will henceforth be an authority only on conjugal love, it seems to me my duty, in the interest, of course, of our common life, to remain unmarried and have a grand passion, so that we may enlarge our experience. Tell me every detail of what happens to you, especially in the first few days, with that strange animal called a husband. I promise to do the same for you if ever I am loved. Farewell, poor martyr darling. End of letter 10. Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, on January 6th, 2007, in Oceanside, California.